Welcome to the digital forum for December. We are pre-recording this digital forum due to the fact that Christmas Eve is our normal digital forum day and everyone is busy getting ready for Christmas. So I've recorded a couple of short videos for year-end projects and a couple of videos on how I process images in Lightroom. I hope you enjoy the videos. Let's talk about password managers. Something better than those paper notes that you might be doing right now. Password managers are a way to be able to keep track of all of your passwords and other items that are important for running your computer or your tablet or your laptop, your phone, whatever. Uh, passwords are daily chore in our lives of uh, being able to do things on all these devices. A password manager makes that easier to do. So let's get started here. There are a lot of reasons to use password managers. I have over 500 passwords plus licenses and other items that I keep stored away and I want them securely stored away. Paper is difficult to keep up. Um, it's easy to lose if you keep it in a sheet of paper or something stuck to your computer or a small booklet. Um, you need to, a way to keep it organized. Uh, you want it easily available. You want it to be a secure but easy way to log in. Password managers do that for you. Let's talk about the different ones and their good and bad uses. Uh, we'll talk about paper notebooks, spreadsheets that you save to the cloud, the built-in password managers from Microsoft, Apple, and Google, and digital password manager programs. I've got three different ones that I'll talk about. The paper notebook. It's the most common method. I think everybody has started this way. Uh, it can be easy to misplace. It's not great to take it anywhere because you could lose it. Um, easy for somebody to get a hold of it and steal your passwords. It can get destroyed in a flood or a fire. Um, and you have to create the passwords manually. You know, you don't want to use one, two, three, and four, or, f you know, four, nine, seven, six, eight. You need to use something that's a little trickier with letters, numbers, and such. So doing that manually is pretty hard. Um, so we have better ways to do that. Um, it's also harder to update and keep organized. If you keep changing a password, all of a sudden you've scratched it out and you've written another one in. If you can't, like I have poor writing, <laughs> sometimes I can't read what I wrote down and struggle to make it work. Uh, the, another way that a lot of people have done it, or it's a suggestion that's a little better than the paper tablet, is a spreadsheet that you store in the cloud. Uh, it's available to all users on your cloud account. It's easier to update. Uh, you still need to manually create those passwords, but it doesn't cost you anything. And it's not encrypted, though. So it's still it's better than paper but it really isn't the best way to do things. Um, if somebody else gets into your cloud storage, they could get your passwords and take over your computer or your se separate programs and such. Uh, there's password managers from Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Um, they're all generally built into the browser and they work okay. Um, I looked at the Microsoft one and it does work. Um, you do have to punch in your passcode to get in to see your uh, passwords, but it, it will remember them. Um, I'm not sure if it creates any. Um, security is lower on Microsoft to my thought over Apple and Google. Um, 
Apple uses biometrics more to get into the accounts and Google uses two-factor identification on a lot of their stuff, depending on how you set this all up. Um, Apple works with all the browsers and it will suggest um, very difficult passwords that would be practically impossible to figure out. So Apple's own password system is not bad. Um, I don't like it as much because it, it's a little harder to get it to work between all your different devices, but it, it can be done. Um, although Apple is coming up with a new system that may actually do away with a lot of passwords. Google um, will work with its browser and it works fairly well. Uh, security will depend on how hard you set the security up in your Google account. Um, they are better than nothing, you know, doing it on paper or doing it on sheets of notes is not the great way to do it. So what I like are the regular password applications. Um, I use a company called mSecure and they have, uh, two different, um, uh, price structures. Uh, one is the essential and the other is a premium. It's a fairly simple password manager program. Uh, keeps track of all 500 of my passwords, tells me whether the passwords are weak or strong, whether I should change them, um, because I maybe used that same password twice. In the beginning, I did like everybody else. I used the same password for everything. And I still have some old accounts that are that way. Um, this one used biometrics to be able to open up the password program. And you can then search out, find, and copy and paste. They also have it so that it will work with your browsers so that it will automatically put in your password when you open up a website and need to log in. Uh, it stores it all in, in either their cloud or your own personal cloud. So you can store it wherever you want. Um, it's got a pretty decent security system. Uh, depending on which, whether the essentials are premium, premium lets you add a few more things, uh, lets you store more paper type things. Um, you can do quite a bit more uh, with it. Um, I also store my driver's license, credit card, passport numbers, um, anything that I need that secure needs to be secured, I store on mSecure. Um, I've used them for a good eight, nine years now, been fairly happy with them. But there are others. Um, these will work on both Windows and PC, so you have a choice. Uh, another one that I've used is LastPass. Um, actually, I haven't used it. I tried it out, and I I found that it works fairly easy. Um, they have, again, two different um, price levels, a $3 and a $4 price level. Uh, the family one lets you have um, more individuals uh, on the account, so that can be good if you've got a family uh, you can share certain passwords with everybody and keep other passwords just for yourself. Um, they create strong passwords. They'll fill in the login information and they keep track of other items like credit cards and such as well. Um, LastPass also does um, dark web monitoring, which can be pretty good. Uh, they do have a security dashboard. Um, they're not too shabby of a, a system. Uh, they rate pretty highly in um, password managers. So all of these come with a uh, trial period, so you can try them out and see. Um, and it, they're definitely worth looking at. The other one that's pretty good is 1Password. Um, it, you only need to remember one password to get in. Now, actually, all three of these, you only need to remember one password to get in, or uh, some of them use biometrics, so uh, 
either a fingerprint or um, uh, face ID, whatever, uh, you can get in with that as well. Um, there runs $299 for their basic one and their family one is $599 or $499, excuse me. Uh, again, they generate complex passwords and will fill in login items on the different websites. Uh, here is just sort of a comparison between their two. You can see that it does an auto save and auto fill of passwords. Um, you can have unlimited passwords. You can share certain passwords and, you know, store credit cards, secure notes. Um, you can do two-factor identification. So there's a lot of things that uh, these password managers can do. So to sum up, um, using the digital managers uh, will store your stuff in a cloud, either their own cloud, uh, Dropbox, um, the, the different Microsoft or Apple's cloud, whatever. So you have ways to be able to access it with all your devices. They create a very complex password, which will keep your stuff safe. The great part is um, paper passwords can be lost in a fire or flood. Having this stored on all your computers, you're not going to lose them. You'll always be able to get that data back uh, for your passwords. They're easier to keep up to date. Um, you don't tend to reuse the passwords. You can use a different password for every login. And if you do use a common word, add numbers and a symbol to it to make it more difficult for the people that are trying to break into your account to figure it out. So just a few items. Uh, it's the end of the year, and I thought it's time to be able to talk about what we should be looking at for the next year. And password managers uh, is a good safety solution for all those different logins that we have to try to remember. Let's talk cloud backup. Cloud backup is your last tier of defense uh, to keep your data safe even if something really bad happens, say a fire, flood, uh, tornado, hurricane, uh, cloud backup would be your last defense for saving your data. There are a number of good ways to do this. Uh, I use it as my last tier of defense. I keep um, one set of hard drives uh, off-site. I keep an extra two sets of hard drives uh, at my place of work. So I have actually four to five backups, um, depending on how old one may be over the other. The good part is the cloud backups generally work in the background and are fairly simple to use. So let's get started. I use Backblaze as my cloud backup. It basically comes as a one price uh, for each computer. It automatically backs up the files in the background while you're working. It's, so it's very simple to use. It does take a lot of time for your first backup, depending on how much you have to back up. Um, I, I have 14 terabytes worth of data, and it took me about three or four months for it to back up because my internet wasn't super fast. Uh, I've got one customer that when we set him up, it took two and a half months for his, um, I think it was 16 terabytes of data to get backed up to the cloud. Uh, he had faster internet. So depending on how much files you have and how fast your upload speed for your internet is will make the choice on how long it takes to back up. But generally, as long as you have other backup methods in place, waiting two or three months for everything to get backed up is not a big deal. Now, you can, if you do have a lot, um, Backblaze, and I even believe Carbonite, 
will, for a fee, send you a hard drive that you can fill up the data on and then send it back to them, and then they'll refund that fee, and you can get it put in right away. Uh, that can work. For me, I just had too much data to be able to do it, and I was willing to wait since I have my multiple backups. But when something bad does happen, or even if you just lose a file, um, you can go back into these programs and download that particular file. Uh, it keeps a sort of a history of your files up to 30 days, or there is an extra tier level if you want to keep that stuff for a year. Um, I find that I'm not worried that much. The 30 days works just fine for me. Uh, it does work um, with a mobile app that you can download files right to the mobile app. Backblaze has just a simple pricing structure. It's $7 monthly, $70 a year, or $130 for two years. And that's for one co each computer that you have, unlimited storage. So it doesn't matter whether you have one terabyte or 20 terabytes. Now, this isn't for business. This is their home use one. So most of us are doing this as a hobby. Uh, if you're doing a business plan, it, then you should look at um, business backups, and they all work a little bit differently and work quite a bit faster. The next company would be Carbonite. Um, they also have home backup. They're priced a little different. They are, for their basic one, it's $84 per computer for just internal hard drives. If you have external hard drives, then it goes to $120 for both internal and external drives, and that, again, is per computer. It will automatically back up photo and data files, and on the higher tiers, it will also back up video files. So all of the, both of these companies have trial programs uh, that you can try them out, um, and I would suggest doing it. Here is Carbonite's uh, basic uh, pricing structure, and you just get a little bit more for each price structure that you go up on. Uh, the one thing that I did worry about that originally when I tried Carbonite, because they were the first ones I tried, uh, they wouldn't back up external Apple devices. Um, I believe they may have fixed that by now. But I couldn't find it on their website that they actually would do external hard drives. So that would be something to make sure you try and see. Uh, but you would have to go to their Plus or their Prime. And you really need to try to find figure that one out before you go and um, purchase their product. Uh, again, that's why I ended up with Backblaze. Uh, theirs was a lot simpler. I didn't have to worry about that problem. Just to compare the two, uh, you can see Backblaze is regular $70 per year, where Carbonite Basic is $84 a year. Although Carbonite does run a number of discounted prices, uh, especially during Christmas time, they had anywhere between 40 and 60% off. So, you know, keep an eye on that if you're looking to do Carbonite. Carbonite really works best with Windows. Um, Backblaze works both Windows and, and Mac, so it's not really a problem. But um, take a look at both. It is definitely worth having a cloud backup as your last line of defense so that you don't lose any of those photos. Um, you never know when something could happen. Your house burned down, uh, get hit by a hurricane or a tornado um, that wipes out the whole house. It just, disasters can happen and you need backups. And I know I harp on this a lot. It's the end of the year. It's time to think about it again as you start to do all those final things to close out one year and start the next. So remember, look at cloud backup. Thanks.
Okay, now I'm going to show you how I process a flower image. Uh, these flowers were taken at Chicago Botanical Gardens uh, this spring during the tulip time, and I'm still in the process of processing them. So I will show you how I will process this coming flower. Um, it's one that I haven't worked on yet, so we'll all see what we end up getting. So here we go. And I like this group of three flowers. And we'll get rid of some of the other stuff, but first I want to merge uh, these together. It is an HDR shot. Uh, I shoot almost all my flowers in HDR just because I want to be able to um, either pick the best exposure or merge them together to get one major one. This one has enough detail that I think I will merge them. So we go to Photo Merge, HDR. We let it um, align them and do an automatic adjustment. Now, um, I do auto align because these were all shot handheld, so uh, Lightroom needs to um, align them all up. And it looks pretty good, so we're just going to click Merge, and we're going to let fo Lightroom uh, merge them all together. Shouldn't take too long. And it creates a brand new raw file. Uh, that is 32 bits and uh, has all the exposure information needed. So here's the one you could see now that you get a lot more detail, um, although I'm probably going to change that quite a bit in the background and such. But we'll take the HDR and the first thing I'm going to do is crop it in because we've got a bunch of stuff that we don't need on both sides of this flower uh, or group of flowers so we'll crop in from the right crop in from the left I think we'll bring it down just a bit on top because I don't want that white one and it's not too bad. I think I'm going to widen this just a bit. See if I can get this one, middle one on the third line. And that doesn't have to be exact, so we're going to widen it a little bit here. And we're going to drop it down a bit. Okay, and you can see this is what it's going to look like once it's cropped. And I think I, I like that crop, so we'll close it. Now, um, it looks a little too bright for me uh, since they're white flowers. Uh, exposure Auto didn't quite do the what I'd like, so I'm going to adjust the exposure a little bit, bring it back down. Um, we can see inside the flower pretty nice. Probably bring that up a bit. And now I want to try to darken the background. Plus I want to brighten up the inside of those flowers. So we'll go to the masking section. And we're going to hit select subject and see if we can get lucky here. And by George, look at that. It selected all three of the flowers just the way we needed it to. Um, I'm not seeing anything that I'm super worried about it that might have gone over so we will work with that now um we're gonna try to brighten up the inside of that flower just a bit so we'll bring up the shadow and that's looking pretty good. We can come back if we want to and work at it a little more. These were really white flowers, so I th but I think we got it where we want it. Now I want to work on the background. So I can take this mask and duplicate it and invert it, which means now it's grabbing all the background. And what I want to do is add a little more dimension to the 
image. So I'm going to darken the background, which brings the white flowers out. And that certainly does bring the flowers out a little bit more. Um, you still can tell it's in a garden. Um, but now the white flowers stand out and the background isn't quite so noticeable. I'm also going to drop the clarity on this background to soften it a bit and even the texture because I want it as soft as I can get it. And I don't want to go into Photoshop and have to really blur this background. I just want it not to be as noticeable. And I think we pretty much have it. Uh, so the only thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into this first mask, uh, which is right down here. And I do want to just bring up the clarity and presence of it. So we'll up the clarity just a bit, and even the texture. And I think we've got a pretty good uh, image going here. I'm going to close the masking part. The last thing that I like to do is to vignette it just a bit to darken those four corners. And that looks pretty good. Now, if you see something you don't like, we can always get rid of it. Um, one thing that I'm having a little bit of a problem with, and I'm going to use um, this tool here, which um, is the Content uh, Wear Remove, and just this little flower up here is rather distracting to me. So I'm going to remove that. Let's see how it does. That looks pretty good. The rest is not too bad. Maybe this one here, where it's a little... We'll just look to remove some of that. And this one here. And let's take a look without it. Yeah, that sort of toned down those spots that were a little too noticeable. And so this would be probably a good finished image just the way it is. But me, uh, I like to play around with this stuff a little more. So I'm going to take this image and go into Color Effects 5. Uh, Nick Color Effects, which means it's going to create a copy of the image with all the Lightroom adjustments. And now this takes a few minutes. And it will bring the image then into Nick. Now Right off the bat, they have this, what they call clear view, which makes everything, as you can see, brings out a little more detail. I'm going to turn that up to about there, and that's really not too shabby all by itself. Um, the other thing that a person can try is, I like the detail extractor. Now, the only problem with it is that uh, the way it worked right here, it um, brings back the background, which I really don't want to do. So instead, we're going to try some control points. And we'll make the control points just big enough for the flowers here. And then uh, let's do a, oh, we'll do one more. We can do one here for this flower. We'll move it over. 
and do one for this flower. So the control points let you control just specific areas. So this way I've got all three flowers that I'm getting the detail extractor. And you can see how much detail I can pull up. And I think I like it about there. Everything else looks to be pretty good. Um, so I think we'll stay with that. And we're just looking to see if there's something else we could do. Uh, the other one that I've, a lot of times I try is Brilliance and Warmth, just to warm it up a bit. And let's just see what happens. This may not work because of the white flower. Uh, it maybe isn't too shabby there. So I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the only other thing um, I have a bunch of stuff that I have started out um, and I'm just trying to think if we should try a vignette maybe with a vignette blur. Oh, that's not too bad bad let's see if we make sure i like the look of that but we're going to um yeah But if we move that so that the center of that, and then just do it this way. That's actually pretty good, isn't it? Um, it's a nice blur around the edges. Um, I think I'm... Uh, we might just bring down the opacity of that just a bit. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with that. So we'll hit apply. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is going to take a little while. But um, Nick will process this image and then it will save it to my hard drive. Okay, so now it's um, took a while, but it, it's now done. And I can see a few more things that I'd like to do as I look at this image. I'm, I'm really getting happy with it. One is going to be um, to vignette it some more around the outside. And then I noticed a couple of things that I would like to fix up. Uh, one is right in here, this little stain. So we're going to try a couple of things. First, we're going to try the content aware one and see if that will actually do it. It would be great if it just did it. And I really like this tool. And yep. It fixed it up just the way I wanted it to. So that's good. Um, the other is, well, I got a couple of areas. I could either darken this area or I could try to see if maybe it will get rid of that. Yep, I'm happy there. And then this tip is bothering me. 
Now this one may not work because it's a tip. Uh, it does, I think it's going to be okay. So let's take a look. So there we go. Um, I think I'm happy with that. It um, has nice soft detail in the background. Flower, three flowers came out fairly nice. Um, so I think I'm going to stay with that. I am going to try one more thing while we've got it here. Um, we're going to create a virtual copy. And then we're going to try black and white. Just because I think black and white might just get me something. So we will play with the color adjustments here to see if we can get the right kind of contrast. And it's really going to be in the yellows. And then you can play, oh, there we go. That's going to bring up some of those pistols and stamens to make them stand out. We'll fool with the red just to see if there's anything there. I just go back and forth on each color. See, now I could bring more detail in those leaves in the background, but I actually think I'm going to just darken that a little bit more because I really just want the flowers. Um, purple, I don't think... Oh, there is a little bit of purple in there. Do we want to just... Bring in uh, to get a little more texture in that background. And the same with magenta. Uh, I think right around there. So you can see just adjusting the, in the black and white mix how you can pull out the details in different parts of the flower by the different colors. And then you can always, you know, finish it off up here. Um, it's generally pretty sharp, so I don't think I need to tweak this too much. So there's my final in black and white. Here's my final in color. Let's go here and we'll select both of them. And we can go to the X and Y, just so you can see the two versions. Um, I think both of them work really well. Um, I like the detail in the color, and but I like the black and white as well. So the only other thing that I'll end up doing is I will mark these two five star. And that tells uh, me in Lightroom that these are finished, that I'm happy with them, and uh, they're good to go for whatever I happen to want to use them for. So that's how I process uh, a flower shot. Okay, the next image I'm going to show you what, what I've done is... Uh, a fall image up in Munising. Uh, I don't remember which lake it was, but we were looking at a nice fall color day, early morning, a uh, little bit after sunrise. We had some nice clouds, and this is the first time that I'm going to process it, so let's take a look at it. So here it is. Um, I also bracket everything that I do in three stops. This is the normal exposure, two stops under, two stops over. Um, this uh, image is actually a half stop overexposed uh, to start with so that I could get a little more detail in some of the shadows, but I do like the clouds. So I am gonna process this as an HDR. So we do photo merge, HDR. 
and it will take those three images. Now this does happen to be on a tripod, but I'll still auto align just in case things move slightly. And here's what the image should look like once it's processed into its merged form. This will just give me a little more exposure detail from the bright whites to the darks because there, there is quite a bit of shadowing uh, in part of the image right over in here that it would be nice if I can pull some of that info out. And you could see that it, it did grab a little bit more detail. So let's go into the develop mode. Now I am going to warm this up just a tad because it is sunrise. And we will darken it just a bit um, and open up the shadow area just a little bit. Now, I'm not going to crop this yet. Um, a lot of times I will crop right off the bat, but um, I'm going to take this into color effects. Um, so, but first I want to bring up some of the detail in the texture, clarity, and probably even dehaze, which helps bring up the clouds. So let's go into Nick Color Effects 5 with my Lightroom adjustments. And again, it's creating a new image with all those Lightroom adjustments. It is creating a TIFF file. And the first thing I do is look at the clear view. And we will turn that up. And you can see how it's bringing out the clouds a little bit more. And I can also see that... Um, I now have a lot more dust showing up, which means we'll have to do some dust cleanup. But we're going to even get a little bit more as I do the um, detail extractor. And you can see how much detail it brought up. Now the clouds were moving a little bit. It was a, a breezier day, so the HDR did give the clouds a nice soft look, which um, I'm happy with. And we'll just see what the different adjustments will do and it looks like i'm sort of happy with it right there now the other one that i will end up doing and i usually use this one quite a bit is the brilliance and warmth and with that I need to turn the warmth up some and the saturation up. And you can see now we're getting good. And it was a nice, bright, colorful day. Um, we've got some nice foreground stuff here now. You can see that it brought out the detail in that shadowed area. The clouds look pretty good. Um, I think I'm happy with that. So let's just hit apply and it's going to process that and bring it back into Lightroom and now you can see that we're looking at we were looking at the image before it got processed and now we have to wait for the processed image to come back into Lightroom. Okay, so here is the image as it came back into Lightroom. And we're going to do, first thing I'm going to do is do a little cropping. And I don't need all the clouds, so I'm going to crop down on the clouds. To about this point. I want that third line to be somewhere in the middle of those trees. 
I think I want to bring this up and it's really going to turn it into a nice little panel. Um, I sort of like that, maybe down just a bit more to get a couple of those lily pads that were still there. So let's take a look. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. I like the reflection isn't bad. It's not dead center. Um, we've got it pretty good here. So now we got to do a little dust cleanup. Uh, that's This is the worst part of it. Um, we probably can do the healing brush, although I think I'm going to keep trying with the content aware. Um, we'll zoom in, and if you hit the home button, you can get started in the upper uh, left hand corner. And it's just a matter of hitting all these dust marks. Now, all these dust marks um, came because I we were shooting in uh, the day before uh, a gale forced winds and with a lot of sand. And I, I didn't get in to clean my camera up. So I've got a lot of dust. And this is also a good time to get rid of things that you might not like, like that right there. And I don't like stuff right on the edge. So we'll get rid of that and that. And then as we go, we could start up to the next corner. So Not quite as bad as I would have thought. But there is a little bit of dust here and there. Fortunately, Lightroom with this new tool really makes it nice and easy to clean up. Did I miss something there? Nope. And if you see something else you don't like, you can always get rid of that. This is a good thing to do on every image, is just go through from beginning to end. And you can clean up stuff that you don't want. Some of these lily pads don't add to the photo at all, so we'll get rid of them. We're almost through. And you can zip through this pretty quick. And if you have a ton more, you can also click on this visualize spots and it will actually make the spots sometimes show up quicker. Um, there's like, you know, but you do get sometimes spots that don't quite won't show up in that, so I still like to look at it this way. But some people do like the visualize spot part. Yeah, and I, some of these things, I just don't like it when it cuts off uh, right here too. And it looks like our final corner. I don't know what that is, but let's get rid of it. Yeah, I got a couple dust spots down here too. Okay, zoom back out. You can see all the corrections that we got rid of dust for. This hasn't been my worst one, so. Um, now, you can decide if you want to do anything else to it. I don't know. You, we can, you can certainly sharpen this up a little bit. This is one that I might actually try. Um, I'll go into sharpen and see if that helps here. 
So I do have sharpen turned off. You can see that some of the stuff is, well, there, that, that's definitely brought it in. Pretty happy with the looks of this. Um, the water, you can start seeing a little bit of noise, so I might just turn up the noise reduction just a bit. I have all that stuff set at zero because I'm usually shooting at a pretty low ISO. And the last thing we're going to do is just give it a little bit of a vignette in the corners. Just helps you to locate in. So... I think that's going to do it for this image. Uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, again, if I'm happy with it, I give it a five-star rating so that it shows up in my collections as uh, a five-star. It's grouped together so that everything, the good image is on top. Um, I would look at this and possibly look at doing denoise on Topaz, although I'm fairly happy with the way it looks this way. Um, I think the only thing that I'm thinking about is that maybe it's a little too warm. And if I just bring up the, cool it down just a bit, the white birch trees are yeah, a little, maybe even they're a little green. Take a look. That looks pretty good. So I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I think we'll go with it the way it is. You know me, I always like to check my vibrance to see if I can get my coloring just a little more. But there's a nice fall day in the northern UP. Hope you enjoyed my processing. I hope everybody enjoyed those videos. I had a lot of fun putting them together. And I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we have a lot of good things coming up for the new year. So we'll see you in January.